पोल पल्स ऑन डी डी इंडिया Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News Hour, India's Voice to the World. I'm Preeti Kaur. Coming up in the next one hour, Middle East remains on the edge even as UN and world leaders call for maximum restraint after Iran's attack on Israel. Biden warns Israel that US will not take part in any retaliatory action against Iran. Trump's efforts to delay New York criminal trial stemming from hush money paid to an adult star fail. Jury selection for first ever criminal trial of a former US president due to start in a New York state court. Campaigning for the first phase running in full steam with political parties garnering support for their candidates, India's Prime Minister Modi to address public rally in South Indian state of Kerala and Tamil Nadu. And in football, Bayer Leverkusen secure their first ever Bundesliga title. Ending an 11-year stranglehold on the league by Bayern Munich. Diplomats at the UN Security Council call for restraint following Iran's drone attack on Israel on Saturday. The council met for an emergency meeting on Sunday with members fearing a full-blown spillover of the conflict in the region. DD India's Jody Jacobs reports from New York. It was a tense UN Security Council meeting and with the UN Secretary General present, an indication perhaps that this matter is of international importance and the fear of a full-blown conflict in that region is now real. Antonio Guterres has called for calm, saying that the world does not need another war. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. Israel, who called for the meeting, said Iran had crossed every red line and it reserves the right to retaliate. This attack crossed every red line and Israel reserves the legal right to retaliate. We are not a frog in boiling water. We are a nation of lions. Following such a massive and direct attack on Israel, the entire world, let alone Israel, cannot settle for inaction. We will defend our future. It's called on the Council to take severe action against Iran. But it was Russia's ambassador that called his Western colleagues hypocritical and of having double standards. The U.S. maintains that it continues to fully support Israel's right to defend itself and will in the coming days explore additional measures to hold Iran accountable. There was a direct message from Iran directed at the United States, warning that should Washington initiate any form of military operations against it, it will use its inherent right to respond proportionately. Iran's operation was entirely in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense as outlined in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations and recognized by international law. This concluded action was necessary and proportionate. It was precise and only targeted military objectives and carried out carefully to minimize the potential for escalation and prevent civilian harm. The Council is yet to decide on what actions it will take, but this latest development will most likely remain on its agenda this week. Jody Jacobs at the United Nations reporting for Didi India. Condemning Iran's unprecedented attack against Israel, U.S. President Joe Biden has pledged a coordinated G7 diplomatic response to the drone and missile attacks. On Sunday, G7 leaders held a video meeting to debate on Iran's attack on Israel. Italian Foreign Minister Antonio Tajani said that he hoped that the Israeli government shows restraint in its response. Iran launched over 300 drones and missiles at Israel overnight, which Tehran said was in response to the April 1 strike on its consulate in Syria. 
The latest attacks have raised threat of a wider regional escalation. President Joe Biden thanked U.S. fighter squadrons that helped defend Israel from a drone and missile attack from Iran. In a video posted on social media platform X on Sunday, Biden hailed the U.S. fighter squadron as incredible. U.S. forces have destroyed more than 80 drones and at least six ballistic missiles aimed at Israel from Iran and Yemen. Hey, you guys are the best in the whole damn world, man. The whole world. Hey, no, that, that's, not, that's not hyperbole, man. Both these, both these squadrons. You're incredible. Absolutely incredible. You made an enormous difference, potentially saving a lot of lives. And thanks to extraordinary skill, the United States helped Israel take down nearly all those incoming missiles. You're, you're remarkable. Earlier, Joe Biden warned Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that U.S. will not take part in a counter-offensive against Iran if Israel decides to retaliate for a mass drone and missile attack on Israeli territory. According to White House official, Biden had informed Netanyahu in a phone call that he would not participate in retaliatory action and that U.S. will not support any Israeli counter-attack against Iran. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Sunday reconvened the war cabinet in Tel Aviv to discuss the response to the Iranian attack. Israeli officials said that the panel favoured retaliation in the meeting. However, it was divided over the timing and scale of any such response. The five-member cabinet, including Netanyahu, Defence Minister Yoav Gallant and Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz, was expected to reconvene for further discussions. As tensions escalate in West Asia, Israel says the country is still on high alert following the attack from Iran. Israeli military said it arm, its armed forces had shot down multiple drones and missiles launched from Iran. IDF spokesperson Daniel Hagari said that Israel's critical mission in Gaza remained the rescue of all its hostages still held by Hamas. Even while under attack from Iran, we have not lost sight, not for one moment, of a critical mission in Gaza to rescue our hostages from the hands of Iran's proxies Hamas, of our moral duty to do everything in our power to bring 133 hostages back home. Hamas recently rejected the hostage release proposal offered to them by the mediators. Hamas and Iran want to ignite the Middle East and to escalate the region. We are still on high alert and assessing the situation. India has urged immediate de-escalation in the wake of rising tensions between Israel and Iran. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar on Sunday held a telephonic conversation with his Israeli counterpart and shared India's concerns over evolving situation in the Middle East after the Iranian attempt to strike Israel. They discussed the larger regional situation and agreed to stay in touch. Dr. S. Jay Shankar also spoke to his Iranian counterpart. The minister took up the release of 17 Indian crew members of MSC Ares. The leaders discussed the current situation in the region and stressed on the importance of avoiding escalation, exercising restraint and returning to diplomacy. Dr. S. Jay Shankar agreed to remain in touch. All right, our correspondent Amritpal Singh joins us live for more on the developments. Amrit, good morning. Now, yesterday an emergency session was held at the UNSC. Uh, get us the update on what all transpired at the session yesterday evening. Out of them, we saw Iran uh, vehemently defend uh, itself and its actions, uh, saying that it had the right to self-defense and uh, it was keeping in. Uh, 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 it was proportionate, the response was proportionate, blamed Israel for escalating it, saying that it hit its uh, consulate in Damascus, and uh, therefore uh, the retaliation, it, it accused the UN Security Council of failing itself uh, for avoiding escalation and uh, holding Israel accountable. Israel understandably uh, accused Iran of hostilities, threatened uh, uh, for the escalation, saying we are, you heard the Israeli um, uh, envoy in the UN saying we have no frog in the boiling uh, water, we are lying, the country of lions. So that kind of rhetoric saying that it will, uh, that there will be a response to it, uh, 
uh, the rest of the world uh, was trying to, uh, you know, uh, caution uh, both sides to de-escalate the situation, exercise restraint and see the situation does not escalate. Uh, while the Americans uh, have called a meeting of the G7 um, uh, to see how it can go further because Israel had called for all, uh, made a, a fervent appeal for uh, imposing all uh, possible sanctions on Iran. Uh, so I think that could be uh, something uh, that the G7 could be discussing uh, because the Americans have made it very clear to the Israelis uh, in that phone conversation between President Biden and uh, President Netanyahu uh, that they will not be a party in terms of uh, any military escalation or will not uh, you know, uh, 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 be with Israel when it comes uh, to military escalation or military retaliation. So I think, uh, you know, the calls for restraint, including by the UN Secretary General, who uh, condemned the Iranians uh, for the attacks and uh, called upon Israel uh, for uh, restraint and said that any retaliation would be violation of international law um, and they should exercise restraint and uh, call for all sides and the all players in the game, the, both the regional and the uh, global players, uh, to, say, uh, to see that it does not further escalate. So what transpired in the uh, UNSC yesterday was on expected lines. Pretty. All right, so that was on expected lines. Now, talking of the situation, um, Amrit, uh, the War Cabinet of Israel favored retaliation in response to the Iranian mm. attack, but uh, it was divided over the timing and the scale of the response. <coughs> uh, at the same time, U.S. President Joe Biden has said that it will not support Israel if it chooses a retaliatory action against Iran. Put all this together. Uh, let us understand more from you. How is Israel positioned at this point in time? Uh, is it uh, capable enough to take on Iran directly? Oh, yes, it's absolutely capable. Militarily speaking, uh, diplomatically speaking, the diplomatic heft it has, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the economic resources that it has at command, etc., it uh, surely is capable of attacking Iran. Uh, the question is, oh, will the world let uh, them do it? Uh, one, uh, not that they care much for the world, but uh, you know, if it further escalates, uh, they will have to factor in the diplomatic response to it, given uh, that, that uh, President Biden has uh, uh, strongly uh, uh, urged President uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, sorry, Prime Minister Netanyahu, to restrain from uh, uh, having a military uh, retaliation and saying that we will not support any such military retaliation. Uh, the European stand uh, would be on similar lines. Uh, but uh, more importantly, what they should, uh, what would be weighing on Benjamin Netanyahu's mind would be uh, what would happen to the 133 odd hostages uh, on which negotiations uh, were on before the attack happened. Uh, there are reports that uh, Hamas has offered to release them, uh, provided the Israelis observe a six uh, week long total ceasefire and allow uh, the, the people to return to North Gaza, uh, the displaced people within Gaza. Now we have to see uh, what the response the Israelis give to that, but they are surely considering uh, what the, uh, 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 considering uh, the uh, offers made from the other side, because uh, as time uh, uh, passes by, pressure within the domestic uh, constituency for Benjamin Netanyahu is building up to get the hostages released. And uh, what if they come in harm's way? So would he take uh, that political, would he uh, want to take up uh, that political, pay that political cost uh, for, for that? And once say, uh, slaughtered uh, uh, images of slaughtered hostages starts playing on uh, uh, television screens through social media, etc. That would be uh, politically very costly for Benjamin Netanyahu. After all said and done, he is the prime minister of the country, but he's also a politician. So uh, they'll have to weigh all that. There are, there are uh, strident uh, uh, right-wingers in his own cabinet who want um, a, a, a muscular response to it. But then, uh, you know, the, 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 the final decision of the war cabinet would weigh all these factors uh, uh, before uh, Iran, uh, Israel uh, takes any kind of retaliatory action. All right, Amrit, India has also uh, urged immediate de-escalation and has uh, also uh, put forth, uh, you know, the solution to be diplomacy and dialogue. Uh, having said that, we've also given a broad outline of the uh, conversation Dr. S. Jashankar had with his, uh, with his Israeli counterpart yesterday. You get us more on India's stance on the issue? 
Uh, when India has uh, called it a humanitarian crisis, India has asked for de-escalation, India has asked for restraint, India has uh, called for uh, not allowing it to escalate further into a regional conflict because that is not in the interest of either parties uh, nor the wider region, nor for the globe uh, in, in general, given uh, how it would affect uh, global supply chains, especially of uh, oil. You already know how the Brent food has gone up and how it could have a further effect on uh, the global economy. And uh, of course, uh, the, the humanitarian aspect of it. So uh, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar uh, had a word both with uh, his Israeli uh, counterpart, also with his Iranian counterpart, urging both sides to exercise restraint and see that it does not escalate uh, further. So because uh, India's consistently been saying that there is no military solution to it, uh, things have to be uh, uh, sorted out on the table, and that is the only sensible way to go forward. All right, Amrit, we leave it here. Thank you so much for joining in with those details. So that was our correspondent, Amrit Pal Singh, spelling out more analysis on the current situation faced by Israel and Iran. We'll keep you posted. Let's turn focus to um, other updates. We'll now track uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky on Sunday said that his country needed help from its allies to repel the threats from the air, just as Israel did against Iran's attacks. Zelensky called, the, called on the U.S. Congress to approve a vital aid package that has been blocked by political conflict for months now. Ukraine's forces are facing new strikes from Russian troops in the east and daily attacks on cities and infrastructure from Russian missiles and drones. And the fact that sanctions against Russia are still being circumvented and the fact that we in Ukraine have been waiting months for a vital support package, the fact that we are still waiting for a vote in Congress, testifies to fact that the confidence of terrorists has also been growing for months. You can't waste any more time. It is necessary to really protect life wherever there is a terrorist threat to it. You're watching DD India News Hour. We're heading for a short break. But after the break, UN urges international community to ensure that the conflict in Sudan does not become a neglected crisis. Calls for empowering women in the crisis struck nation. Spain braves unusual blow of heat, leading to a fire raging out of control in the mountains of Tarbena. Rain further aggravates the crisis and flood hit Kurgan region, forcing authorities to issue evacuation advisory to the people across the region. Back after the break, you're watching DD India News. Uh, let's get you more international updates. U.S. former President Donald Trump says he will be fighting for himself, but more importantly, he shall be fighting for his country. On the eve of his New York trial, Trump posted the statement on social media platform Truth Social. He noted that election interference like this has never happened in the U.S. before and hopefully will never happen again. Trump faces court on Monday on criminal charges stemming from hush money paid to an adult star. The first ever criminal trial of a former U.S. president is due to get underway on Monday with Donald Trump facing fraud charges in New York. The case revolves around hush money payments he allegedly made to an adult star to cover up an affair. Trump denies the charges, but the trial could have a major impact on his re-election bid. India's U.S. correspondent Nick Harper reports. 
A lot at stake here for the former U.S. President Donald Trump. This case relates to a payment of $130,000 that was allegedly paid to the Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 presidential election. That payment was made to try and keep quiet about an affair that had taken place between Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump, an affair that Donald Trump allegedly now wanted to keep quiet at a time when he was running for president in 2016. Donald Trump denies both the affair and the payment. Now, he's been trying to delay this, and we've seen various last-ditch attempts to push back the case indefinitely. However, a judge has ruled that out, and it will begin later on Monday. It means for the next six weeks or so, Donald Trump will not be on the campaign trail. Instead, he'll have to be in court every single day. The likelihood is that he may try and use that as an opportunity to rally as part of his re-election campaign. He could speak to reporters and supporters outside court each day, either before that day's proceedings or after they have concluded. But it does mean that he won't be able to hold the large-scale rallies that he favours as a result of the need for him to be in New York City for this trial each day. Now, on Monday, we will see jury selection. That could take several weeks. Remember, they will be looking for 12 impartial jurors who feel that they can give Donald Trump a fair trial. There is a possibility that Donald Trump will testify uh, for himself during the course of this trial. It's something that he's suggested that he wants to do. However, undoubtedly, his lawyers would probably persuade him not to, as it could open him up to a whole raft of questions. This trial in New York, revolving around these hush money payments, is just one of four criminal trials that the former president is facing. However, it may be the only one that comes to trial before November's election, the other three all facing substantial delays. In Washington, Nick Harper, reporting for DD India. Chad's interim president, Mohammad Idris Debi, kicked off its, his presidential campaign on Sunday for the election next month. Shad's election is meant to end three years of military rule on a promise to strengthen security and boost the economy. Debi's government is one of the several untas that seized power in West and Central Africa since 2020, drawing concerns of a democratic backslide. Shad is the first of these to organize elections, despite regional and international pressure to swiftly hand power back to the civilians. Debi seized power in 2021 when his long ruling father, Idris Debi, was killed on the front line against rebels in the north. The United Nations has called for greater humanitarian assistance to aid refugees and displaced people fleeing Sudan after the war between Sudan's army and the paramilitary rapid support forces. UN has urged the international community to ensure that the conflict in Sudan does not become a neglected crisis. The United Nations entity dedicated to gender equality has furthermore called for immediate steps to protect women and girls and support their economic empowerment and include them in peace negotiations and decision making. Despite the magnitude of this crisis, UNHCR says funding is critically low and threatens aid deliveries. According to the UNHCR, it will need $284.5 million to respond to the crisis in South Sudan and has only received 18% of that funding. The United Nations said that more than 1.7 million people have now fled Sudan due to the conflict there. Many are now in South Sudan, Egypt, Chad and Ethiopia, where they are in desperate need of humanitarian aid. DD India's Patrick Oyetz reports from South Sudan's capital, Juba. Fighting between Sudan armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces is continuing in Sudan. Every day, more Sudanese people are crossing into other countries fleeing violence at home. The East African regional body, known as Intergovernmental Authority on Development, says the only way out of the conflict is through a negotiated settlement. We hope, uh, as IGAD, that also we are working on that issue to solve that problem so that the region is at last peaceful and uh, uh, could concentrate in its role of solving conflicts, uh, solving their economic, problem, uh, economic development, uh, building infrastructure, building peace 
and working also together uh, for an economic integration of the region. EGAD has appointed a South Sudanese lawyer to head the mediation team for the Sudan process. One South Sudanese political analyst says South Sudan is in a better position to head the search for peace for Sudan. EGAD needs to make use of this position of a stalemate as a way of bringing the parties together so that there is going to be an aspect of resolving this problem. Or else, if there is not going to be that possible, then there is possibility of a long civil war that is going to affect Sudan. And that thing will have a very big impact on South Sudan. There are more than four parallel peace processes for Sudan now. IGAD is leading one process. The U.S. and Saudi Arabia are heading another one. There is also a Libyan-Turkish process and an effort led by Egypt and Chad known as Neighbors of Sudan. We are with the resolution of the, of the IGAD. And if the IGAD changes its position, then it will sit again and decide what to do. Violence erupted in Sudan in April last year and up to now there is still no clear plan to end the fighting. The Intergovernmental Authority on Development, the African Union and the United Nations mission in South Sudan are urging members of the international community to speak with one voice, harmonize the peace processes and find durable peace for Sudan. Patrick Oyet in Juba reporting for DD India. Let's take a look at other stories making it to the headlines from across the world now. Cuban activists protest demanding stricter legislation to combat animal cruelty. The activists walked through Havana's Colin Symmetry with flowers and posters to pay tribute to Janet Ryder, an animal rights activist who died in 1931. The move aims to prevent cruelty and raise awareness about the need to protect animals. Winner of the 2024 Olivia Awards handed out on Sunday for achievement in London theatre, eminent actors and performers were seen dazzling the show with grace. The award show at Royal Albert Hall in the British capital was hosted by Ted Lasso star Hannah Weddingham. Every Saturday night, the esplanade of a seaside in Havana turns into an open-air cinema. Before sunset, dozens of families arrive in Havana's La Pantilla with chairs to reserve the best spot to enjoy movies projected on the wall. The outdoor movie screening project is led by a group of young Cuban film lovers who seek to provide free entertainment to the community. All right, and more international updates. An earthquake of magnitude 6.2 struck New Britain region in Papua New Guinea on Monday. No threat of tsunami was reported yet. The earthquake was at a depth of 79 kilometers. Papua New Guinea sits on the Pacific Ring of Fire, the arc of seismic falls around the Pacific Ocean, where much of the world's earthquake and volcanic activity occurs. The governor of Russia's Kurgan region urged people to evacuate flooded areas, saying rain was worsening the already tough situation there. More than 107,000 people have been evacuated in the country since the beginning of the floods. The Interfax News Agency also cited the government of the Tumen region saying that two villages were being evacuated as the authorities feared the area could be threatened by the Ishim River. The TASS News Agency cited Russia's emergencies ministry saying more than 14,000 houses across Russia have been flooded. A fire raged out of control in the mountains of Tarbena in Spain, leading the authorities to evacuate up to 180 people from their homes. Wildfire comes as Spain grapples with the unusual blow of heat, with many places marking 10 degrees warmer than normal for the season. The regional head of the Interior and Justice Ministry, Elisa Nanez, visited the field operations centre where firefighters are operating. Experts claim the warmer weather is due to warm air masses continuing to circulate over much of Europe. A short break ahead, but still to come on this edition of DD India News Hour, political fever grips the entire nation. Stay with us as we get your report on the poll pulse in Arunachal Pradesh. Devotees offer early morning prayers, marking the seventh day of Chaitra Navratri. Indian 
स्टेट ऑफ तमिलनाडु वोटिंग इज अवर रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी दिस इज अ बिग फाइट बिटवीन बीजेपी एंड इंडिया अलायन विल यू वोट हां वोट या पावर ऑफ डेमोग्राफी दिस इज अ ह्यूज बीजेपी इज ट्राइंग अ बेस्ट यू नो फॉर द पास्ट 10 इयर्स अंडर द फ्लैगशिप ऑफ श्री नरेंद्र मोदी गाडो दी 2024 लोकसभा पोल्स इन तमिलनाडु आर विटनेसिंग द बैटल रॉयल बिटवीन डीएमके एआईडीएमके एंड द बीजेपी Welcome back after the break you're watching DD India News Hour a quick relook at the top stories once again Middle East remains on the edge even as UN and world leaders call for maximum restraint after Iran's attack on Israel Biden warns Israel that US will not take part in any retaliatory action against Iran Trump's efforts to delay New York criminal trial stemming from hush money paid to an adult star fail Jury selection for first ever criminal trial of a former US president due to start in a New York state court. And in football, by Leverkusen secure their first ever Bundesliga title ending an 11 year stranglehold on the league by Bayern Munich. And now we get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. In India campaigning has gained momentum ahead of the general elections 2024 spearhead spearheading the campaign India's prime minister and BJP senior party leader Narendra Modi is on a visit to southern states of Kerala and Tamil Nadu where he will hold public rallies Indian home minister and senior party leader Amit Shah will attend public meetings in the country's northeast states of Tripura and Manipur later in the evening Shah will hold a road show in the northwestern state of Rajasthan while the defense minister rajnath singh will hold a public rally in the union territory of jammu and kashmir bjp national president jp nadda will hold a public rally at masuri masuri in northern hilly state of uttarakhand india's health minister mansukh mandavia will file his nomination papers from port bandar lok sabha constituency this morning Opposition Congress Party's President Malik Arjun Kharge will be campaigning in Puducherry in support of Puducherry Lok Sabha candidate V Vethilingam. Another Congress leader Priyanka Gandhi Vadra will hold a road show in the city of Alwar in Rajasthan. BSP chief Mayawati will hold public meeting at Moradabad in Uttar Pradesh. All right. Let's uh, get you live inputs from our correspondent, DD India's Anbu Rasan joins us from Chennai. Anbu Rasan, good morning. Uh, let us get more from you uh, when we talk of the political fever gripping the southern state of Tamil Nadu. We tell our viewers that today the Prime Minister will be addressing a poll rally in the state. Uh, just two days uh, before the po poll campaign is concluding, first phase in the election, Lok Sabha election on April 19th. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is going to visit a consecutive eighth time to Tamil Nadu today in Tirunelveli uh, near the Agastyam Pali, where he is attending the political rally and uh, conducting the public meet, uh, uh, supporting the BJP candidate Nayanar Nagendra, the current MLA of uh, Tirunelveli constituency. Uh, supporting uh, uh, Prime Minister's visit to the various uh, 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 Lok Sabha constituencies, Coimbatore, Chennai. and vellore this is a fourth and already prime minister already visited uh, trinal valley just uh, uh, last february only so the continuous visit to tamil nadu prime minister emphasizing on uh, getting more support for bjp because uh, this is a state where last time they didn't get any seat and also focusing on bjp and this uh, triangular uh, fight between uh, adnk dmk and bjp alliances so if they get more seat on that it will be add on the 400 the mark which is set by the uh, the bjp so it will be helpful for them and also uh, chief minister mk stalin yesterday addressed the tirupur constituency rally where he is uh, given a seven uh, seven point to the public where once the india bloc will come to the government they will do and also today the 
Indian uh, Indian National Congress President Mallikarjuna Khadke addressing a political rally in Puducherry, and also BJP National President J P Nadda also right. addressing the political rally in the Puducherry. So, just a two days election election campaigning is going to come uh, conclude on seventeenth of this month. So, the political campaigning and the all in full swing. So, last minute to reach the public for getting more votes. Um, all right, Anbarasan. Also, when we talk of the constituencies going to the polls on the first uh, phase, in the first phase of polling, that polling that will be held on 19th of April. Uh, let us get more from you. What is the significant uh, factors that we should look forward to in these uh, constituencies, given the political contest, uh, given the expectations of the people? Uh, let us get more from you as an overall evaluation of uh, the constituencies going to polls in the first phase. Uh, first. Phase itself, Tamil Nadu facing all 39 constituencies, including Puducherry one constituency. So, out of that 40 constituencies across uh, first phase itself, they are going for poll. So, the entire state is going for poll on uh, April 19th, and this constituency is particularly uh, the parties of ADNK, DNK, BJP are contested in a very tight corner because uh, last 2019 and 14. They didn't have this tri uh, triangular fight. This is the first time they are having it. So the fight between all the constituencies are very much a very tight fight. So they are last mile reaching to the voters to get more vote on that. Particularly the BJP uh, uh, nominating on various star candidates, state chief K. Annamalai in Coimbatore and uh, actress Radhika Sharad Kumar in Viridhanagar, former governor Tamil Nadu Soundarajan in Chennai South. So, fielding of uh, winnability candidates in both of uh, the DMK side and also the ADMK and uh, also BJP. So, they get more uh, attention for the candidates, so they get more seat and winnability for that. So, this election kind of going to get uh, always a Tamil Nadu going for a one slide uh, for DMK or ADMK in previous uh, 2014 and 19 election. This time, the expected should be a uh, the people and the vote surveys are saying it should be a triangular fight due to that all parties are may get some votes, some seats. So it may gaining uh, for the both BJP, uh, DMK, ADMK and all across the uh, uh, right. candidates. All right, Anbarasan, thank you so much for joining in with those details. And uh, the Lok Sabha constituency of Nagaland in the northeastern state of India will witness its election during the, phase, f during the first phase of the Lok Sabha elections. Now, renowned for its scenic tourist spots, Nagaland grapples with various issues, setting the stage for an intriguing electoral battle. Our correspondent, Tabs Bhattacharya, brings us the latest updates on this. Nestled in India's northeast part, Nagaland holds a singular Lok Sabha constituency. Scheduled for election on April 19th, Nagaland's solitary Lok Sabha election coincides with the early phase of the general election. In 2019 polls, the National Democratic Progressive Party or NDPP BJP coalition clinched victory over the Indian National Congress. Now, Nagaland comprises of 16 administrative districts inhabited by 17 major tribes and various sub tribes each distinguished by unique customs, language and attire. Agriculture serves as the primary livelihood for over 85% of Nagaland's population. The state boasts of 13,17,536 total voters, including over 19,000 first-time voters, with female outnumbering the males. Additionally, Nagaland counts 22,140 senior citizens aged above 85 and 6,688 persons with disabilities among its electorate. Now, what to expect in 2024 Lok Sabha elections in Nagaland? In the forthcoming 2024 Lok Sabha elections, a triangular showdown is expected for the single parliamentary seat. Competing for the seat are S. Supong Meren Jamir from the Congress, Dr. Chumben Muri from the NDPP BJP Alliance, and the independent candidate Haitung Tungwe Lotha. Jamit, the state new president of the Congress and a former MLA, is venturing into the parliamentary election for the first time. Now, Dr. Murray is a newcomer to parliamentary polls. Lotha, a multifaceted personality with roles such as social activist, uh, politician and entrepreneur, previously contested the 2019 Lok Sabha election under the National People's Party banner. 
In a strategic move, the BJP has opted to back its ally candidate in Nagaland, throwing its support behind the NDPP's candidate for the Lok Sabha seat. With Kaur person Naveen, this is Tapush Bhattacharya for Diri India from Nagaland. All right, Diri India, Shishu Shalar is joining us from Mumbai. Shishu, good morning. We've seen how hectic campaigning uh, has been uh, witnessed in Maharashtra, uh, talking of the constituencies that go to polls. Shishu, am I audible? Talking of the constituencies yes, that go to polls uh, in the first phase, help us understand. We believe that the entire, we see that the entire Vidarbha region will be uh, witnessing polls in the first phase. Help us understand the political contest. What marks these constituencies uh, different, or for that matter, what are the highlights which we should look forward to uh, during the first phase of polling on 19th of April? Absolutely, Preeti. Uh, on the first uh, phase, you'll see that Eastern Vidarbha region of Maharashtra will go for polls, and that's the reason we have seen a you know, star campaigner. I've been campaigning in the East Vidarbha region, uh, starting from Prime Minister, had two rallies uh, in East Vidarbha. We've also seen uh, Amit Shah and uh, Yogi Adityanath, uh, UP Chief Minister, also held I mean, rallies uh, in Nagpur also and the German area. Uh, on the other side, uh, we've seen Rahul Gandhi, uh, Congress President uh, Malika Khadge, also holding rallies in the entire area. So obviously now uh, the action polling actions were going to uh, I mean, they take uh, fast action here, and that's the reason the star campaigners are lined up now. But just two days left for the campaigning uh, for East Uttar region, and that's the reason uh, we have seen a many big name will be coming here, and not just the politicians. Let me tell you that uh, in Chandrapur constituency, uh, where uh, BJP is, uh, uh, and Sudhir Mundanti are contesting, you've seen a lineup of the celebrities have come for the campaigning here, right from Sunil Shetty to Ravina Tandon, and we've seen some of the more celebrities who will coming. Uh, for the campaigning in Eastern Asia, but obviously it's a, a jam-packed day uh, you know, for the political parties and for the rallies here. The second important aspect, uh, you know, that we tell you that Vidarbha, especially the Eastern Vidarbha region, is a very important one and of course a very sensitive one uh, because we've seen the Gachiruni uh, uh, constituency, uh, which is the Naxal of the constituency, and that's even when we went uh, to Gachiruni uh, constituency yesterday, uh, we have seen that how the, you know, uh, the entire security forces have been deployed at the very sensitive areas. And what is the most important fact here, uh, Pretty, you know that uh, this time around, uh, the Election Commission of India has started the home voting process, especially for the elderly people and those who have disabilities of more than 40%. And that's the reason, now these uh, other polling uh, officials uh, who will conduct the polls will go to the home to these elderly people and you know, will be able to uh, help them cast their vote. And that's what we've seen, a 100-year-old a uh, person in Gadchuli district uh, yesterday or day before yesterday uh, cast their vote and the police officials who went to these homes also. No matter uh, where these homes are and how difficult uh, those terrain and areas are. But the important thing is that uh, for just one person, nearly 50 commandos along with the police officials going uh, at the, you know, uh, at the voters uh, with this person house and, uh, you know, help them to cast the vote is one of the important aspects that we've seen. Uh, and probably most of the voters are quite happy with it because uh, obviously, uh, you know, they want to cast their vote, but uh, due to uh, you know, the age factors also and due to disability, they cannot come to the polling station. And that's the reason that these initiatives really help voters to cast their vote that we have seen, particularly now. They're going for the first phase and going another uh, for the next uh, uh, six phases also, we'll see the same response. And what is uh, these you know, voters have been talking to us, well, they're quite enthusiastic about the election commission move. Uh, probably right. it should have been done quite early, but obviously uh, it's uh, never late. Uh, that's the reason. Now, other uh, talking about the uh, constituencies like Chandrapur uh, and Nagpur, also, because Nagpur, we have seen the Union Minister and Nitin Gadkari will be contesting, and that's really it's quite an important constituency. Uh, well, uh, he will be holding rallies uh, you know, in, in a complete day here today, also. Right. That's when he will hold a uh, rally here and also address a press conference in the. Uh, so, it will be a hectic day of political campaigning. Uh, we leave it here, Shisha. Thank you so much for joining in from Mumbai. And from Mumbai, Maharashtra, let's turn focus to Arunachal Pradesh, which is witnessing a two-corner fight in the upcoming Lok Sabha elections. Now, the candidates are busy campaigning in different parts of the state spread across the hilly terrain. The promise of development and infrastructure push around the state is something that people around Arunachal Pradesh recognize. Now, DD India's Dibindu model has this special report from the state. Development along Arunachal Pradesh has been a key focus of the government here. From roads to a new international standard football stadium to schemes such as Jaljeevan Mission has impacted the lives of the people of the state. 
the mega infrastructure push by both the state and the central government is visible on the ground in Arunachal. The BJP is confident that the developmental work done by the party over the last 10 years would bring them back to power with a thumping majority. कांग्रेस का समय में पूरा का पूरा रोड खत्म करके रख दिया कुछ काम नहीं किया रोड मैप है अलकतरा तक किया है बोला है लेकिन कहीं जाने से रास्ता दिखाई नहीं देता है वो लोग बोला है कि हम लोग ब्रिज बनाया ब्रिज कई जगह में देखा है कि तीन खंबा हरा है उस पर कोई नाम आदमी जा सकता है ना बंदर जा सकता है ऐसे सिचुएशन है मोदी जी का जो मंत्र बोला है उसका मुताबिक और जो जैसे उन्होंने किया है उसी का मुताबिक फ्लेक्सी प्रोग्राम से उसको कवर कर सकता है कुछ कुछ चीज द पीपल ऑफ अरुणाचल प्रदेश कंसिस्ट ऑफ मेनी ट्राइब्स सेटल्ड इन डिफरेंट हिल्स स्प्रेड अराउंड द स्टेट The quaint lifestyle and humble lives of the people here have still kept many aloof from the modern and urbanized societies in many big cities of India. The people around the state still follow their ancient traditions from wood cutting to even hunting in many parts. The modest houses spread around even in their adjoining areas of the capital of Itanagar speaks volumes about the lives of the people of this far northeastern state. The major source of income for thousands of people here still comes from farming and cattle rearing. Bimar hole ye Rama Krishna jata na paisa na se aadmi marega aise ta na gaon aadmi bala to na paisa lene malum nahi hone se aadmi mor jata na paisa hone se aadmi bas jata na medical जाना है कुछ कुछ करना है इससे है ना सारा हम लोग प्रॉब्लम होता है ना लाइक दिस ओल्ड फ्रेजाइल मैन हु बिलोंग्स टू द निशिंग ट्राइब डोमिनेटेड मोस्टली अराउंड द अरुणाचल वेस्ट कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंसी देयर वोट कुड बी अ डिसाइडिंग फैक्टर इन दिस इलेक्शन द विलेज इज हियर ऑल दो वेल कनेक्टेड थ्रू रोड लोकल से लैक्स गुड हेल्थ केयर एंड स्कूल अभी पिछले सात आठ साल में तो हम लोग यहाँ में अरुणाचल में डेवलपमेंट तो बहुत हो रहा है लाइक सड़क हो गया ना रोड का ये अच्छा हो गया रोड बना दिया उसका बाद में और पानी जल जीवन मिशन का अभी घर घर में पहुंच रहा है पानी उसका बाद सैनिटेशन ना वो वो सब सब कुछ दिख ही चल रहा है मेरा हिसाब से मैनी अराउंड अरुणाचल प्रदेश आर ऑल्सो हैप्पी विद वर्क डन बाई द गवर्नमेंट but wants more from the new government which will be elected here but some also say there has been no development that has taken place in the state and the ruling bjp has not thought about the poor people arunachal pradesh goes to polls on the 19th of april and with just few days left for the polls those in arunachal are also keeping a tight vigil with cars and movement of people around are being thoroughly checked at several barriers put up across different parts of the state this hustling and bustling city of itanagar the capital of arunachal pradesh which is a part of the arunachal west constituency is all excited to elect and vote for its new member of parliament kiran rijiju will test his fate against the congress's nawam tuki on the 19th of april the people of arunachal pradesh will decide who their representative will go to delhi with camp person jagmohan this is the bindu model from itanagar the capital of arunachal for dd india india is celebrating the 7th day of chaitra navratri devotees across the country gather to offer morning prayers to commence the 7th day of the 9 day hindu festival All right, let's get you updates from the world of business now. Asian shares slumped and gold prices rose on Monday after Iran's attack on Israel on Saturday stoked fears of a wider regional conflict and kept the traders on the edge. Markets in Asia began the week on a cautious footing. MSCI's broadest index of Asia Pacific shares outside Japan fell 0.7%. Japan's Nikkei slid more than 1%. Hong Kong's Hansang index slumped 0.8%. The escalating tensions also sparked a, fly, a flight to safety that sent gold rising 0.51% to $2,356.39 an ounce. Brent crude futures peaked at $92.18 a barrel. 
last week. That was the highest level since October. S&P 500 futures and Nasdaq futures each rose 0.15%. All right, Daily India's Chris Gilbert joins us from uh, Tokyo for more. Chris, uh, help us understand how do we expect the markets, uh, do we expect the, the cautious uh, stance of the markets to continue this week as well? Yeah, well, it all depends on messaging and also uh, how the U.S. markets behave and how the Asian market behave for the rest of the day and the U.S. markets uh, open Monday their time, maybe about 12 hours or so from now. But Asian shares were expected to take uh, a dip on opening Monday following similar behavior in the U.S. Last week, of course, uh, over there, they're still dealing with, uh, you know, ongoing inflation, uh, dampened hopes about interest rate cuts going into the summer. But also, as you mentioned, the uh, rising conflicts in the Middle East are adding new volatility into the mix. Uh, one analyst uh, calling it a bitter uncertainty uh, that as an ingredient that has been uh, added into inflation, interest rate cuts, and, and, the, and, and the normal um, you know, fiscal language that we use. Um, a lot depends now on... Um, uh, the, how this plays out in the coming days and weeks. Uh, but for now, you're quite right. There are concerns that this may push the price of uh, oil beyond 100 US dollars uh, a barrel, and uh, investors do seem to be fleeing to safer pastures such as gold and treasuries. All right, Chris, we'll leave it there. Thank you for joining us with those details. And from business, we now turn focus to sports updates. Bayern Leverkusen scripted history as they won their first Bundesliga title on Sunday with a thumping 5-0 win over SP Word and Bremen. Xavier Alonso's side new victory would secure the silverware with five games to spare and there were no signs of nerves as they produced a performance worthy of champions. Under Alonso's guidance, Lever Leverkusen are currently on a Bundesliga record unbeaten run to 29 games, 25 wins and 4 draws to chalk up 79 points. Leverkusen won the Bundesliga title with five matches left to end Bayern Munich's dominant run in the league. It was not even a close race in the Bundesliga this season. As champion, Leverkusen have a 16-point lead over Bayern with five matches remaining. Stefano Tsitsipas clinched his third Monte Carlo Masters trophy in four years with a commanding 6-1, 6-4 victory over Kasper Rout on Sunday. The 12th-ranked Greek will return to top 10 on Monday. He also won the title in the Principality in 2021 and 2022. Tsitsipas di displayed dominance from the start, swiftly securing the opening set by winning six consecutive games in just 36 minutes. Tsitsipas is the fifth man to win three or more Monte Carlo titles, joining Rafael Nadal and Jean Borg. Thomas Master and Ili Nastase, who won three apiece. On to IPL action now. Royal Challengers Bengaluru will take on Sunrisers Hyderabad in the 30th match of the IPL season 2024 today in Bengaluru. Faf 2 Plessis led RCB are languishing at the bottom of the table with just one win and five losses from six matches. They are coming into this clash on the back of a four-match losing streak. In their last game, Bengaluru lost to Mumbai Indians by seven wickets at Wankhede Stadium. Hyderabad have blown hot and cold in the tournament, having won three and lost two encounters. However, after winning their last two games, Pat Cummins and company will be confident of continuing the winning run against RCB. Meanwhile, Chennai Super Kings defeated Mumbai Indians by 20 runs on Sunday night at Vankere Stadium. An extraordinary late charge from MS Dhoni backed up well-worked half-centuries from Ruturaj Gaekwad and Shivam Dubey as Chennai scored 206 for four. Chasing 207, opener Rohit Sharma carried his bat and scored 105 off 63 balls, but his efforts went in vain as the host fell short by 20 runs to cross the finish line. Sri Lankan pacer Mathisha Pathirana came up with his best IPL figures, showing a stellar performance. He claimed four wickets for 28 rounds, effectively restricting Mumbai to 186 for six. Reigning Asian Games champion Pala Gulia clinched the bronze medal in women's 10 meters air pistol event at the ISSF Final Olympic Qualification Championship in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil on Sunday. In the process, she also backed Olympic quota for India. The 18-year-old Palak finished with an overall score of 217.6 to finish third. She has ensured that India will have full allocation in both rifle and pistol shooting events at Paris Olympics. 
Each country can obtain a maximum of 24 quotas in shooting for the Paris Olympics, with eight available in rifle and as many in pistol and shotgun events. Indian shooters have already secured the maximum 16 quotas available in rifle and pistol events. India's remaining four shooting quotas are in shotgun events. Northern province of Vietnam ranks fourth in the top 10 less visited wonders of the world. Nien Bin, the vibrant city of Vietnam, is a place steeped in history and culture that is as colourful as the landscapes surrounding it. With spiritual tourism sites, Nien Bin is indeed one of the hidden wonders of the world. All right, with that, we end this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, and also Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Preeti Kaur signing off, and from all of us here in Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News Hour.